One more. Okay, we got all three going. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Roger Paul, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to uh, do an introduction to the Urantia book. Uh, and I'm a little bit early here, I think. Am I not? Yeah, I got about one more minute. So everyone just kind of hang out for a minute. Let me get all my computer stuff straightened out here and we'll get started. Let's see here. Let me... Try this share. See how this is going to look. That comes out pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that, Does that look all right? That's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh -oh. Okay. Let me go back to the original share. Oops, I don't know what I did there. I don't know. I just dropped this, sweetie. Huh? I just dropped this. <laughs> Is that okay? You did what, dear? I dropped this with the connections now. The white thing. I don't know if they're just rolling forward. Oh, okay. I can't hear you, dear. Because there we go. We're back. That's good. Okay. It looks like it's going to be just us three, four, one, two, three. Uh, Y'all will see two pictures of me on the broadcast because I've got both the computers going with my picture on it. And if I turn one of them off, one of them won't record. So I'm going to have two of me for those who are seeing all of us in the group. Hey, Rodney. So hey. I am ready to start. Let's say a little prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. We thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, please open our hearts and minds that we might remember a little bit of this and share it with others. We thank you for all your many blessings, especially Jesus, our, our creator son. And we thank you for this revelation, which we're going to talk about today. We say this in the name of your son, Michael, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. 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 Okay. Here we go. Hope some other people join us. We'll see. And we'll <coughs> let y'all read like you normally do, if you would, uh, anybody that wants to read. And uh, well, let's start out here. I'm going to talk about the introduction first a little bit. First of all, uh, the reason we're doing this is to introduce people to the Urantia book that either have never read it or had just started reading it or been reading it for a long time and never really understood uh, where the book came from, where the revelation came from. And the rep, the information on that, the best revelation information on where the revelation came from, is in the book itself. So you're gonna in this process uh, for the next couple of hours, we're gonna actually read many paragraphs from the book as to what, who, and what did this revelation and why. We also have mm -hmm. information for, uh, about. Uh, who the contact commission, who they contacted to reveal this revelation to, and who the, the six individuals were involved in the contact uh, commission. And to get started, I want to start out reading one paragraph from the very beginning of the book, and then we're going to go from there, okay? And I'm going to talk about the book a little bit here. Get my mouse back over here. There we go. Okay, so I will explain to everyone where this paragraph came from. On these, uh, every one of these paragraphs are these two uh, notations. The one in the parentheses are the paper numbers in the original book. For instance, this is page one, paragraph one up here. Okay, so that's where that, that's what that's talking about. Also, after that, it shows the section and it'll be uh, or the papers, which is one through 196, the section of that paper and the paragraph in that paper. So let's start out with this very first paragraph and uh, I will read the first one and then we'll go from there. 
in the minds of the mortals of Urantia, that being the name of your world, there exists great confusion respecting the meaning of such terms as God, divinity, and deity. Human beings are still more confused and uncertain about the relationships of the divine personalities designated by these numerous appellations. appellations. Because of this conceptual poverty associated with so much ideational, Id, Id, ideational confusion, I have been directed to formulate this introductory statement in explanation of the meanings of which be at, should be attached to certain world, word symbols as they may be here and after used in those papers which the Ravantan Corps of Truth Revealers have been authorized to translate into the English language of Urantia. So, Right off the bat, it tells us that Urantia is the name of our world. In other words, this is the name of our world that all the rest of the universe calls us by. We're not called Earth. Earth is a term for dirt, basically. So they don't call us Earth. They call us Urantia, okay? And inside your, uh, that name, we're also associated with three different things. First, a local system which is Satania, and it's not named after Satan. Satan was named after it. Our local constellation, which is Norlachidek, and then our local universe, with it, which is Nebadon, and all these lay inside the seventh super universe. There's seven of them. We're going to go into that. And our super universe is called Ervantan. Okay, so that's what all this. The reason I use this slide as the very first one is at the beginning of the Urantia book is a forward. And the forward was the very last thing that was ever produced for us. Okay. And the reason they did a forward is there were so many terms they had to introduce to us to make it clear to us in the book. They actually had to explain the terms they were going to use throughout the entire book. And that's what's in the forward. And the forward is the most difficult part of the book. And if you've just starting reading the book, we don't recommend you start out with the forward because you're just going to get confused unless you want to li listen to our videos on the forward. And then it's explained in great detail. OK, so that's why we we use uh, the forward as a explanation of everything that's coming afterwards. Most people, when they start to read the book, they start in the life of Christ. And reason being, it's like reading a novel. You can go, start at the beginning of the life of Christ and go all the way through it fairly quickly, and it will open your heart and mind to Jesus as your uh, as your Lord. Uh, yeah, Rodney, go ahead. I like uh, the phrase conceptual poverty. Oh, I did that good. <laughs> yeah, we have a real conceptual poverty about divinity in our society don't we we don't we don't even have concepts for the things they explain in this book I'm starting out with you. i'm hearing two of you oh that's because you're i'm, I'm are you muted. did i unmute myself down here i may have no your other two. one is muted huh? oh okay your other one is muted yeah i'm muted on both of them so you should just be me. is it still echoing yeah, and I hear you, and then I hear this. And you're muted, too? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, you're muted. I mean, I'm muted. Okay, should be fine. That's the best I can do, I think. Okay, so here we go. Let me go down one paragraph. <laughs> this is what the Urantia book looks like. This is an older version and a newer version. The one on the left is a book itself with the original dust cover. cover. The, set, the other side is a paperback that came many years later they produced it. Now, I'm going to give you all some information as to where I got all this stuff from. First of all, let's take a look at the original book. This might be of interest to some folks. The original book was a blue book like this, the Urantia book. This is the 1955 version of the Urantia book. There's only 10,000 of these that were printed. So if you got one, you're a lucky, lucky person. I looked for about 10 years to purchase one of these, finally found one on, on eBay 
uh, paid $800 for it too. So I, I purchased six books before I actually got one that was a real 1955 version because everybody said they were, but in reality they weren't. So I want to show you what a 1955 version of the Urantia book second page looks like. And if you can see this, it says first printing on it, right? Mm -hmm. First printing. That's the way you know it's a 1955 book, and they're very, very rare. Because if you go to any other book that uh, of the Urantia book, it's going to show you on the bottom of this first page all the different printings. See this one down here at the bottom? This down here? That oh, shows when where my hand is right there's there that shows right down there where when let me get it over here when these were printed okay and this particular one is a 1973 book version of the book this was my original book and if you look inside this you'll find all over my book these little uh yeah. written in things in the column when I first started, got this book, I was going through it and I was going to disprove it. So all these little things are the Bible verses associated with the book. And of course, instead of me disproving it, I proved it to myself that it was true. Okay. Because there's so many uh, quotes from the Bible itself in it. Also, I want to be fair in doing this presentation to tell you all about a history of the Urantia book. Most of the history information is a compilation from this book right here. It's called A History of the Urantia Papers. It was written by Larry Mullins, and it has Dr. Meredith Sprunger in it also. It's a fairly big book. It's got several hundred pages, 400 and something pages in the book itself. But this should be required reading if you really want to study the book. It gives you all three versions of the history of what happened to bring the book about. And I'm going to go through three versions, three versions of the history. Yeah. What do you mean by that? There were two previous histories of the Urantia book before Larry Mullins decided to do he calls his the unauthorized version of, the, of how the book came apart and he felt like it was it was important to do this him and Meredith Sprunger, Sprunger got together and started discussing the different versions of how the book came to be so they wanted to get it straightened out so he used the two previous versions one of them was from I believe the history from the Rancha Foundation's uh, archive and the second one was from the University of California one of the universities in California and at Berkeley we're going to see some quotes out of those uh, and their version is a little bit different but they got together and they critiqued the Urantia book okay and there's been several groups that's done that a group of 12 ministers did it several universities did it the the University of Berkeley actually offered a course on the Urantia book back in the 70s. Okay, so there's been some differences of opinion on where it came from and that sort of thing. But the Larry's is the best I've ever read. It's very, very good. He also, you can see on in the slide next to me, that he also, uh, him and his wife, uh, Larry and his wife, Joan, uh, basically took the life of Jesus from the Urantia book and, and mixed it with the, some photographs from the movie Jesus of Nazareth, okay? And put them together. And it's a wonderful presentation. My wife both on, and I both have a copy of it. And it's, it's a great way to read about Jesus because it's got some really nice pictures and that sort of thing. Okay, so here we go. Let's start out this morning, this afternoon, I should say, with the contact commission. Who is the contact commission? The contact commission are a group of six people. Eventually it started out as four and then it grew to five and then eventually to six. But they are the people that the original midwayers contacted through what they call a sleeping subject. And this is the first, this is the original contact commission. Now, 
no one outside this contact commission ever saw, heard, or anything to do with the midwares or anything else about the revealing of the book. Only these six people, okay? And this is going to become real important later on in this presentation. So let's read this first first uh, paragraph here. Darren, would you like to read our, our contact commission thing? Unmute first. <clears throat> The Contact Commission. The final makeup of the Contact Commission as it saw the project completion consisted of six members, Drs. William Sadler and Lena Sadler, Wilfred and Anna Bell Kellogg, Emma Christensen, or Christy, and Bill Sadler, Jr. Okay, some information for you. Dr. Sadler and his wife, Lena, were both psychiatrists. OK, and I believe they were both ministers and psychiatrists. I believe Wilford uh, Bell Kellogg, I believe he was a doctor also, but I can't swear to that. I, that's the information I have. All right. So it was Dr. Sadler and his wife. Kellogg and his wife. And then the Emma Christensen was their uh, stenographer. She took notes during this whole process. And then William Sadler Jr. was about 16 when this started. So when he got out of uh, his um, service, uh, his time in the service, after his four years in the service, he actually became a full-time member of the contact commission also. By that <laughs> time, he'd grown up and he was ready to take over that position. But there's a lot, lot, lot involved in this. But I wanted to make clear from around 1911 through 1942, this is the group of people that were contacted and told things about the book. Now, I want to make it clear that the first 18 years of this, the contact commission were being trained and prepared for what was to come. So the first 18 years, they didn't get anything of the book. And that's that's this is going to be important later on. That's amazing. After, yeah, it is amazing. Dr. Sadler said he had 240 sessions with the contact person uh, during these 18 years. OK, and we're going to read that in another thing in a little bit. But I want to make it clear that from 1911 through 1924, they did not get any part of the paper. They were only trained to prepare them for the paper. Then in 1924, they actually started getting the Urantia book itself in the form of papers revealed to them. Okay, so it was 1924 before the actual book started to be revealed. And that went on through 1942. Okay, at 19 by 1942, all four parts of the book had been revealed and had literally been closed down. But it was 1955 before they actually published the book. OK, so any questions on that? No. Nope. OK, here we go. See if I can get this to change. Here we go. This is pictures of both William Sadler, Dr. Sadler and. Uh, Lena Kellogg, which became Lena Sadler. Notice this is Dr. Lena Sadler. And this is from 1924, her picture. I'm not sure when the picture of Dr. Uh, Sadler was, but it was fairly early because he looked like a fairly young man back in. This information on this slide gives the background of Dr. Sadler. And I'm not going to belay this by reading each and everything. But Dr. Sadler has se had se several doctorates. He was trained in theology. He was trained in psychiatry. He cut psychiatry. He was trained as an MD. He was trained by Freud in 1911 on, on, uh, on psychiatry. And he had written, I think, about 20 some books before this started. OK, so he was a well qualified psychiatrist when this started, and he was an expert in psychic phenomena. And we're going to find this out a little bit later here. We're going to read uh, a statement of his saying how or why, how and why this book was not done certain ways and how it was done. OK, 
So you can read through that on your own. You can download these slides from our website. I got a link at the very end of the slides where you can get them. Or you can also get them. Let me show you here real quick. Let me switch um, shares here. To this one. Okay. And on this one. Hmm. I have our website, one of them here. Here we go. This is our website, the Fifth Epical Revelation Fellowship.com, and the Atlanta Urantia Study Group.org is exactly like it. But I have put a new link in both of them at the very top, right underneath our statement, say an introduction to the Urantia book by Dr. Roger Paul. Do you see that? Cool. If you cl If you click on that, it will take you to the web page where I have the very first time this week that I went through the both parts of the introduction. But what I want to show you is this. Let me see if I can go down here a little bit. Underneath this, I have a link for the PowerPoint no notes we're looking at today. Okay. And it's under both, ver both one and two parts of this. Now I'm going to add to this website as we go through this as a group, I'm going to add those videos to the underneath this as we go through it. OK, but you can download. You'll notice if I put my mouse over there on the bottom, it says the Atlanta Urantia Study Group and Introduction to the Urantia Book by Dr. Roger Paul dot PPTX. That is the slides. OK. All right. Let's let me uh, go back to the share again here and go back to our slides. The reason I want to show you all that is so you understand where all these slides are if you want to download them yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's go let's go to the next slide. This is an a, a slide also of the pictures of the contact commission. And you'll notice here now what I need to tell everyone too, this notice I put from Larry Mullen's history of the Uranch paper, all these. All these pictures and these charts I'm going to show you during this come from Larry Mullen's book, okay? And some of these can come from the history stuff and some of them from other places. Some of them say where they come from. Now, this is a picture of Annabelle Kellogg and Wilford Kellogg from 1942. This is two more of the contact commission. And down in the corner is William Sadler Jr. here and Christie. She was the stenographer, okay? And this also includes a picture of Dr. Sadler as he got older, because some of these pictures are, of him are very young. This is Lena Sadler. Uh, after she had aged quite a bit, she died in 1959, I believe. And here's a picture of Christy when she was a little bit younger. Okay, next. Now, in the slides, I have this picture of the master universe. And the reason I'm going to switch gears here is you can see this picture a little bit better from the website itself. So these pictures are not only on these slides, but they're on our main website. And I'm going to switch uh, chairs again so I can talk about this master universe. Here we go. All right, this picture is a little bit easier to see than the other one. Also, if you go out to the website and go to the forward and look at the pictures in the forward, you can take this picture and you can blow it up as big as your screen is. So you can read this a whole lot easier. Okay, so that's why I wanted to show everywhere where it was. You can see it came from the website. <laughs> Excuse me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the universe to you, which no one has ever told you. All right. If you look at this picture, this would be a picture of the master universe plus the, the all four outer space levels. And this is looking as if we were looking from the top down. OK, is it possible to get this picture from the top down? No. Why would that be? Because if you look basically at a, the, a real picture, of, a closer representation of the master universe, it's going to look more like this. I'm going to show you here in a second. If I can get down here. This is all pictures from the forward that I've inserted. 
There we go. It's coming up. I know it's coming up here somewhere. Or did I pass it already? I think I may have passed it already. I believe it did. There it is. I went the wrong direction. You see the top of this slide up here? This is in our book. This is a better representation of the way we look at the universe. Notice it's kind of oblong or oval. This is kind of looking from the side, and this is more realistic. Paradise is right in the center. Around that is the 21 satellites, uh, uh, seven for the Father, seven for the Son, seven for the Spirit. And around that is a billion worlds of what they call Havona. Okay, on the outside of Havona are two gravity dark island belts. And what it does is it balances the gravity of the universe to keep these seven super universes to falling from falling into it. Okay, but the thing of it is there's so many of these dark gravity bodies, we would call them black holes. Okay. There's so many of these you can you could not actually see from any of the seven super universe through them to see paradise. OK, the other thing is because paradise is so sp spiritually bright, it would blind out everything else. OK, but these little things are the seven super universes. So the master universes divide into seven pieces of a pie, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah, Rodney. Um. You said a better view of the master universe. That's yes. actually the grand. That's the grand universe. The master universe includes the four outer space levels. Which right? are not included. Here. Which are not included in this picture. I just wanted right. everybody to get the idea that we're looking. In reality, you would have to look at the universes from the side because we're way out. I'm going to show everyone this here in the next slide here. Let me get back over here. Oh, come on. What did I do? Let me do it this way. Here we go. The only thing about this Mac is I have to move it around to get it to go where I want to go here. Wrong direction. Here we go. Okay. This is what I want to show y'all. So if we're looking from the top down, this center thing would be paradise, right? The next thing around paradise are the 21 satellites, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Spirit. Past that is the seven rings of Havona, and that's a billion worlds. So as we travel in through the seventh super universe, we eventually have to go to every single one of those worlds before we get to paradise. Okay? There's the Where dark hour. Where, where are the mansion worlds in relation? The mansion worlds are out here in the seventh super pair, super universe. Okay? okay. And we're way out here on the very edge of the seventh super universe. So if you see where the point of my, my little arrow is, can everybody see that? We're yeah. way out here. Now, these other big circles are the seventh are the seven super universes but to look at this properly you got to remember these aren't separated like in this picture these universes b bump right up against each other so you could think of this more like a big pie and one big slice of the pie is the seventh super universe hmm. the other thing that's a misnomer in this picture is paradise itself looks like it's this little ring in the center in reality the matter of paradise is bigger than all four of these rings on the outside for real so it's huge beyond belief and then the seven super universes are out on outside of that so they're huge right then when you get past the seven super universes there are four outer space rings developing more and more super universes like these are but they all 
multiply in multiples of seven. So there's seven times these in the next one, seven times seven times seven times seven for the next one, et cetera, et cetera. So there's more and more and more. What's really nice about this is this, we're on the very edge of the seventh super. We're way out in the middle of nowhere. Okay. They say there's only two other planets that are out farther than we are. Okay. Ooh. So that means if we train our telescopes right in the middle towards the Milky Way. You with me? And we looked in towards the Milky Way. If we kept going all the way through the Milky Way and went and went and went and went, what we would run into is what? The Dark Island bodies and then Havona. Okay. And then after that, the satellites in paradise. That's the direction it's in. But if we take our, our, our telescopes and point out the opposite direction of the Milky Way, then we're looking at what? The outer space levels. Okay. <laughs> so that's where we are. And you got to remember, this is not flat like it's, it's on its side. So we're looking in on its side. All right. I'm going to show y'all a couple more little slides to, so you can get a better idea of what we're talking about here. So this is a slide of what paradise, the 21 satellites of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And these rings, the seven rings of these are the planets of Havona. Okay. And this area, this area on the outside of that would be the dark island, islands of space. All right. This is another representation. See these, this black ring, that's the dark islands. These smaller rings are Havona and all the planets. And this is a representation of just the seven super universes. And we're way out here. Okay. Now, how do we know this? I'm going to tell you the little secret. It explains this in great detail in a book called what? You read your you book. Yeah, you got it. Y'all are so <laughs> smart. It makes me sick. <laughs> All right. And this is how the super universes broke down. There are seven super universes. There's 70 major sectors. That means there's 10 major sectors in each of the seven super universes. There's 7,000 minor sectors. So there's a thousand minor sectors in each of the super universe. And last but not least, it shows the local universes and then the constellations inside the local universes and the local systems inside the local units and eventually the inhabited planets. But what I want to point out is this. You see this 700,000? There's 100,000 local universes in each of the seven super universes. So what does that mean? That means there are 700,000 local universes and if there's 700,000 local universes guess what else there is 700,000 creator, creator suns that's right Damn. One, one for each local universe and local mother spirits and exactly. Emmanuel's that's exactly right. And that's what these others see. This is why they tell us inside the Urantia book itself explains everything about where this information came from. Okay. And that's why we're doing this presentation. We want to show you what's in the book that explains where all this stuff comes from. Make sense? Yeah, right. Yeah. Could you go back a slide? Yeah, sure. This one? So, um, it's saying uh, 700,000 local universes. Right. Isn't that the total amount after they're all created? That's right, Rodney. That's the total amount after they're all created. Now, we know, our, we'll know from the book later on that our local universe is about a little bit over a third done okay so our local universe still has almost two-thirds that of planets that have not evolved into real places yet right 
along with our local system of Cetania. You see this here on this slide, it says local systems. Mm -hmm. For each system, there will be, what, a thousand planets, okay? So our system itself right now has 619 planets. And they said there's four or five that are being ready to readied right now for pop to be uh, populated with humans. Okay. <clears throat> so 619 were number 606 out of the 619 planets that's been created so far. So that means the balance of our thousand planets haven't even been created yet. Mm. A long way to go till we got a long way to go, and that's not all. But our local universe is only one little bit over one third done, so that means almost two thirds of our local universe is yet to be created. So, Michael, our local universe sovereign, and the local universe mother spirits are going to be busy little bees for a long, long time, right. OK, now, not only this, of the 700,000 universes, they don't tell us how many of them are done. OK, and each one of these has a creator son and each one of these has uh, each one of these local universes has a uh, hundred constellations and, and local systems. And it all breaks down that way. This is another interesting thing. A standard day in the the super universe is 30 Urantia days. Okay, so it takes 30 days uh, for it to get past that. All right, let's go into the creator suns. The creator suns, um, let me let you read this one, Rodney, so that I don't... Yes. Uh, voice a break here. The creator suns are the makers and rulers of the local universes of time and space. These universe creators and sovereigns are of dual origin, embodying the characteristic of God the Father and God the Son. But each creator's son is different from every other. Each is unique in nature as well as in personality. Each is the, quote, only begotten son of the perfect deity ideal of his origin. Okay. Creator sons. Most important thing we're going to talk about today. Creator sons are the children of God the Father and God the Son. The local universe mother spirits, we're going to hit a slide on that in just a minute. The local universe mother spirit are the children of the infinite spirit. Okay. The creator sons themselves are the male influence of the super universes. Okay. The local universe mother spirits are then what? The female influence in the local universes. Okay. So for every creator son, there is created by the infinite spirit, a local universe mother spirit. And the creator sons and the mother son of uh, the mother spirits are equal in power and glory once the, the creator son feel, fulfills his duty as the sovereign. Okay. So the creator sons, every single one of them are called Michael. That's because they're of the order of Michael. And guess who was the very first creator son? Michael. Michael, right? <laughs> Created after the original son. So they're all called Michael sons. So the creator sons not only have the title of Michael, but each and every one of them are unique. They have their own names. OK, which they don't even tell us. They don't think it's important for us to know the title title of our own creator son, because we know him as what? Jesus. Right. Each creator son must do seven bestowals of himself in, a, in the life of every type of creature 
he creates from the highest to the very lowest and our lowest one of course is humans so that's why jesus came to this planet to do his bestowal as a creator son okay now a couple things i want to mention in this paragraph first of all is the nature and the personality of every creator son is totally different, to totally unique. So what does that mean? That means that every single local universe is going to be unique because it's patterned after that unique creator son. Okay. But they make a point of this to say this in this paragraph, every single creator, excuse me, creator son is the own quote quote it says here only begotten son why would they say that because in every single local universe there is only one creator son that's it no more okay so he is the only begotten son of god for that local universe okay makes sense yeah all right let's go on to the next one um, let's see, Pam, would you like to take this one for us? Sure. I do not know the exact number of creator sons in existence, but I have good reason for believing that there are more than 700,000. Now we know that there are exactly 700,000 unions of days and no more are being created. We also observe that the ordained plans of the present universe age seems to indicate that one union of days is to be stationed in each local universe as the council, excuse me, counseling ambassador of the Trinity. We note further that the constantly increasing number of creator sons already exceeds the stationary number of the union of days, but concerning the destiny of the Michaels beyond 700,000, we have never uh, been informed. Okay. So why do we, how do we know there's at least 700,000? Because there's 700,000 local universes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we know that's a number. Okay. Why do we not know the exact number? Because they say that at least a mi they know of about a million creator suns, but those they think are going to be used in the outer space levels. Now, the creator suns have to go through an internship with a previous creator sun to even start as local universe. So probably many of those creator suns are working as interns in the current 700,000 local universes. Okay. So that's the way that works. Now, they know that there's 700,000 unions of days. Now, the union of days is the ambassador of the paradise trinity, right? Okay, so there's one of those for every local universe. An interesting point is this. Our particular creator son, Michael, or Jesus, his number is 211,121. Okay, 211,121. Guess what the union of days number is? Same thing. Yeah, 211,121. Guess what the local universe mother spirits number is? Same thing. 211,121. So they were either created simultaneously or very near the same time. So for every creator son, there's created a union of days or vice versa. And every creator son there's created a local universe mother spirit but an interesting point is this at this point there are only 700,000 union a days they did not create more union a days for whatever remaining creator sons is out there did they yet Roger yes is that the proper term create well <laughs> Probably a better term would be the eventuate term. Okay. In other words, they're brought into existence as needed. But I, I back up on that a little bit on one thing. Now, we know that the local universe mother spirits are eventuated, right? But because there's a combination of creation between the infinite spirit, I mean, uh, 
God the Father and God the Son, I think a created term is better for the Michaels, right? <clears throat> and probably since the unions of days are all created from both the Father, the Son, and the infinite spirit, there's three persons that create these. I would say they were probably created too. <clears throat> you see the see the difference? Hey. However, since the local universe mother spirit is brought into existence for the creator sons by one being, the infinite spirit, that's the only being involved, then I would say that the local universe mother spirits were probably eventuated as needed. Right? <clears throat> now I did mention that the local universe mother spirit is the female influence. Did I not? Yes. Right? The local universe mother spirit being the female in influence is evolved, involved in creating every single female influence of all the angels in the local universes. So the, the uh, all the angels are female. None of them are male. Okay, so if you get the idea there's that these angels come down and some of them are male and some are female, they're not. They're all female. Okay, mm -hmm. the, uh, the female influence created by the local universe, mother spirit. So all of them, all the way down from the seraphim, the cherubim, the sanabim, all of them are all female. And they all work in pairs. A they call it a positive and a negative care, a dominant pair and a submissive of the pair. So they're all female. I want to make sure that's clear. So if you think the universe is run just by male influences, I got news for you. That's not the case. And uh, let me mention one other thing. Both God the Father and God the Son are both what? Male and female. They're not just male. They call God the Father the Father so that we understand he's the father, the head of the house, right? But he has just as much female as he does male, okay? And the same way with the son. And if you think that God the Father doesn't understand the female, you're dead wrong, okay? <laughs> when your thought adjuster is assigned to you, and I'm going to talk about the thought adjuster a little bit later. It's a fragment of God the Father. Each one of us get one just before six years old. When you get the thought adjuster, guess what? It doesn't matter if they're assigned to you if you're male or female. It makes no difference to them. Okay? So bring that little point up. Okay, let's let's go on. Now we're going to talk about the local universe mother spirit a little bit here. Um, Jane, were you planning on reading or not? I don't remember. I don't, I, I don't think I can see clearly the uh, words. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to. Let's let's go on. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll take this one. And then that way we've got four people reading. When a creator son is personalized by the universal father and the eternal son, then does the infinite spirit individualize. You see that? Individualize. Doesn't say create, did it? A new and unique representation of himself. You know, it's interesting here because I think they should have used representation of himself, herself, to accompany this creator son to the realms of space. There to be his companion first in physical organization and later in creation and ministry to the creatures of the newly projected universe. So for every creator son, there's a local universe mother spirit and sh she not only helps him physically organize thing, but she later upheld holds everything and she projects every single minister to human beings as angels to every single person, right? So she's very important, just as important as a creator's sons. Okay. Diane, would you take the next one, dear? Before the events I'm about to de delineate, Michael of Nebadon had bestowed himself six times after the sim similitude of six different, six differing orders of his diverse creation of intelligent beings. Then he prepared to descend upon Urantia in the likeness of mortal flesh, the lowest order of his intelligent will creatures. 
and as such a hum as such a human of the material realm to execute the final act in the drama of the acquirement of universe sovereignty in accordance with the mandates of the divine paradise rulers of the universe of universes. Okay, notice here that before Michael came to earth and became Jesus, he lived an entire life as all six other types of beings. And finally, his last life was as a human being, the lowest type. Now, notice here it says that this is a requirement for the sovereignty of his local universe. So every single creator son has to do the same thing. And this is by order of the paradise rulers of the universe of universes, which would be whom? The ancients of days. Okay, so they have no choice if they want to claim sovereignty of their local universe. They have to bestow themselves with six or, or seven orders of being, one of each type of being that they create. Now, this takes millions of years for the creator sons to do this. Okay, and you'll notice if you go through the paper on the bestowals on Michael, in between each one of these bestowals are the long period of time in between each one so it takes a long time for these creation creator sons to do this all right so the people person we meet mention as michael of nebadon nebadon is our local universe so he's called michael of nebadon he's also called christ michael because he was the christ that came to earth and we call him jesus christ or christ michael He's the same being as Jesus of Nazareth, okay? Important, important part. So before Jesus ever was born of Mary and Joseph, he, li he lived six whole lives of beings he created before that. That means that Jesus or Michael lived billions and billions and billions of years before he ever came to this planet. That's a lot of years, right? Okay. Now, you're wondering by this point, what's this got to do with how this book got here, aren't you? Are you got to that point yet? Yeah. Yeah, I've been oh. wondering. Okay. Yeah, well, I we're going to bring it all together here in a minute. <clears throat> the reason I wanted to give you all the background of the universe and the creator sons is because unless you understand where you are, you can't understand who you are or why you are, okay? And unless you understand these basics, you cannot possibly understand why the celestial beings made a decision to bring a revelation to this planet to explain who, what, when, and where you came from, okay? Hmm. So that's how this all comes together. I'm giving you the background you need to know to understand the stuff we got coming up, okay? Roger? And it was, yes. Pam, I'm just Pam. sort of assuming that we are the only planet that needed this revelation. No, they, they need to do this for every single planet. Wow. Pam. Actually, you know, it's really funny. The book we just were talking about reading talks about how, um, oh, the guy did the fantasy about going to the mansion worlds and stuff. And he talked yeah. about how, the Urantia book, because it was one of the first planets they did this to, was being taught to other planets so that they could understand where their background, because they hadn't gotten around to doing the revelation for that particular planet yet. <clears throat> so these, his concept was the fact that when these individual mortals get to the first mansion world, they have to be trained the same stuff that we have to, that we have to train in of reading the book on this planet is it gives us a step up so that when we get to the mansion worlds we're prepared for all the things they want us to know mm -hmm. does that make sense oh yeah so think of it this way this is our kindergarten and then the first mansion world is our first grade right Six times before he came to this planet. All right. Let me go to the next one. 
Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to use two mic mouse at the same time. All right, I read that one already. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. Roger, sure I got glasses on now. I think I can see it. Okay, sounds good. I'll bring I'll bring you in on the next row. Go here. I got Rodney and Pam, and then okay. you'll be next. Rodney, would you take the next one, please? Sure. But make no mistake, Christ Michael, while truly a dual origin being, was not a double personality. He was not God in association with man, but rather God incarnate in man. And he was always just that combined being, the only progressive factor in such a non-understandable relationship was the progressive self-conscious realization and recognition by the human mind of this fact of being God and man. Okay, so it's under, uh, important to us to understand what they're talking about, a dual origin being. Now, Jesus was a dual origin being in the fact that he was born from God the Father and God the Son, but that's not the, what they're talking about here. They're talking about the fact that Jesus was not God incarnate in man. He was always God, and he became a man uh, to earn his sovereignty in, as God in his local universe. Okay, so he was always that dual origin person. Okay, but he did not come to the total realization that he was God and that he created the local universe while he was living on earth until he was almost at his time of baptism. Okay, so when he was a little boy and he was born of uh, Mary and Joseph, he was God, right, from the time he was born. But he didn't know that he was God. He did. That's what they're talking about this self-conscious realization he didn't realize he was god but as he grew up and he got older and became a man eventually his memories of being the creator son started to sink in and by that time eventually his human mind by the time he was baptism he realized totally that he was the creator of the local universe and that he was god and man at the same time. Makes Roger, sense? don't yes. you think that about the time when he was given a, a thought adjuster that this would have been a, a a revelation to him then? No, because the thought adjuster, even in Jesus, when he came to him when he was a child, would not invade the conscious mind to the point where he would begin to talk to him immediately. And why would that be? Because of the mechanical association of the human mind in the brain with a spiritual being would be too much for him. And it would probably short circuit his brain. I see. Okay. That's why. And so he had to come to the realization that the father was within him exactly like we do. OK, and why would that be? Because if he did not do it that way, his experience as a human being would not be real, would it? It I would see. be diff different than our experience. And the whole point of him living an entire life as a human being is to gain the experience exactly like we did. A good example of that is this. First, he was born of a man and woman, just like we were, right? His personality and who he was was superimposed on that person, and that's a mystery in itself. But he lived his entire life, and by the, by the time he reached his baptism, he had finished everything required of him for his bestowal, with one exception. What was that one exception? Death, oh. wasn't it? For him to finish his bestowal, he had to die a normal life like every other human being, because if he did not do that, he would lack the experience of death. And if he lacked the experience of death, then all that went before his bestowal would mean nothing because he didn't gain the whole experience. So 
when he was in the, in the Mount of Olives and he was praying to God, he was on his knees praying to God. And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. Remember that statement? Why was that? That was because the human Jesus had the premonition of the horrible death he was about to have. And even though he knew that death was about to occur, he would give of himself to follow the Father's will all the way to fruition. And the only way he could do that is do what? Die a normal life because he's God. Is he not? He's God. He's the God of this universe. He can make the decision just in his life immediately, right? But then what would he be lacking? The experience of death, right? And you have to have the experience of death. Oh, gosh, I just had a epiphany. Yeah. Hmm. What was that? Oh, God, I'm going to try not to cry. I just just realized <laughs> I just realized the experience what we're talking about I went through last year. You know? When you get to the point where you cannot breathe and you know you're dying and there's not anything you can do about it. Nothing at all. That is the experience of death okay mm -hmm. and when we were in our car accident you know the emf people kept kept me alive you know but i looked over at, at my wife i looked over at diane and i told her sweetie i'm dying I, i'm not gonna stay here I, I, i'm going i can feel i'm going and that's what i'm talking about you know that's the experience of death. And you cannot replace that with anything else. You can't, you know, you can't think you experienced it, but you have to go through it. And that's the, what Jesus had to go through. He had to go through the horrible amount of pain and agony and taking that last breath before he did what? Assumed sovereignty of his universe. Roger. Yeah, yeah Rodney. Um, but not all creators' sons, they all must experience death. Yes, but not a horrible one. Yeah. yeah. Not something yeah. as cruel and awful as ours did, right? The reason Jesus died on the cross is because horrible, cruel man put him there. Okay? He could have yeah. lived out his rest of his life to old age and died of natural causes. And he would still be what? He would still be the Christ. He would still be God. He would still be our savior, if you would, because he came and showed us the way to eternity. How did he show us the way to eternity? He, re he introduced us to God the Father. And by introducing us to God the Father, we become a realization of our own thought adjuster. And that thought adjuster is what gives us what? Eternity, right? That's the way it is. But this is how Jesus became self-conscious and recognized in his human mind that he was God and man. Okay? And I apologize for breaking down on y'all. I don't know All how to right. do that. No, realizations are great. Yeah. Um, okay, next. Who's up? Pam, you're up next. Okay. No mortal can presume to know how the Urantia papers were materialized. <laughs> Dr. Sadler actually often declared everything that is known about the materialization process can be found in the Urantia papers. Recall that we have no record of any member of the contact commission actually witnessed the materialization of any written material of any kind. We have no testimony that any contact commissioner, commissioner observed any uh, miraculous event associated with the materialization of the revelation. 
there were apparently no known so-called psychic processes or events used. Did y'all catch that? There were no psychic process or events used, okay? There weren't any mediums. There weren't any people around saying, I can talk to the dead. I can write things out from the dead and all this stuff, right? They say here, it says here that no mortal can presume how the papers were materialized. Dr. Sadler actually knew more about it than anybody else. And he says he didn't understand it. Okay. So they didn't actually witness any materialization, any miracle in front of them. Okay. A miracle they would consider would be, probably be talking to the, to the midwayers that made it possible through this contact person. Okay. Um, but they didn't apparently didn't see anything that would be considered a miracle during this process. And that is very hard to understand. That's why we're using the papers themselves as the information is where the, the papers came from and why. Yeah, Rodney, did you have a question? So are they no saying the same thing as they saw nothing supernatural? Natural. Nothing supernatural, right? OK, even what they did saw was not see was not supernatural by any stretch of the imagination. Right. OK. I've got something I'm going to me and Diane are going to read to y'all today uh, that I think is important enough to insert into this this pr presentation because you cannot find this anywhere hardly. Um. I'm, we'll read this first paragraph, and then I'm gonna we're gonna go into reading a, act, the actual appendix that this came from. Okay, and this may be the only time you see or hear of this, unless I take the time and type this whole thing out and put it in slides. It'll never be out there anywhere else. So, okay, uh, Jane, would you take this for us, please? <clears throat> the mind of mischief. Dr. William S. Sadler, Editor's Note. The following was written by Dr. William S. Sadler in 1929 as an appendix to his book, The Mind at Mischief. Dr. Sadler is known to have been intimately involved in the process which resulted in the publication of the Urantia book. It is the opinion of some individuals that the sleeping subject to which he refers in this appendix, along with the phenomena associated with this person, is a description of the process by which the content of the Urantia book came into the possession of Dr. Sedler and the contact commissioners. Okay. Now, at this point... I am going to actually read, it's only two pages, but I'm going to read the actual appendix statement, okay? And the reason I want to do this is you can't find this anywhere. The original Mind at Mischief book only had this in it in the first printing. In the second printing, after Dr. Dadler, Sadler's death, it disappeared, okay? So it wasn't there anymore. So to have this is quite a privilege in itself, okay? So I'm going to read the first page. I'm going to let Diane read the second page for y'all, okay? Save my voice a little bit. This is from the Appendix of a Mind at Mischief. In the discussions of fraudulent mediums or self-deceased psychics, which Dr. Sadler was an expert in, the reader of this book has several times encountered the statement that there were certain exceptions to the general indict indictments there made and was referred to this appendix. It now becomes my duty to explain what I had in mind when those footnotes were inserted. This is what Dr. Sadler felt he had to say. In the interest of scientific accuracy on one hand and of strict fairness to the other, it becomes necessary to explain that there are one or two exceptions to the general statement that all cases of psychic phenomena, phenomena which have come under my observation have turned out to be those of auto-psychism coming from the human mind. Okay? 
It is true that practically all the physical phenomena have proved to be fraudulent, while the psychic phenomena are almost invariably explained by the laws of psychic projection, transference, reality shifting, etc. But many years ago, I did meet one trance medium, a woman now deceased, whose visions, revelations, etc. were not tainted by spiritualism. As far as my knowledge extends, no time did she claim to be under influence of spirits, guides, or controls, or to communicate messages from the spirits of departed human beings. Her work was largely as, as a religious nature and consisted of elevated sayings and religious admonitions. I never had the privilege of making a thoroughgoing psychic analysis in this case, and I am not in position to express myself as to the extent to which her revelations originated in the subconscious realms of her own mind. I make mention of the case merely to record the fact that I have met one instance of psychic phenomena, apparently of the trance order that was not in any way associated with spiritualism. So he met one person in all his life doing this that was not spiritualist. All right. The other exception, this is the sleeping subject. Okay. The other exception has to do with a rather peculiar case of psychic phenomena which I find myself unable to classify, which I would very much like to narrate more fully. I cannot do so here, however, because of a promise I made, which I feel under obligation to keep sacredly. In other words, I have promised not to publish this case during the lifetime of the individual. I hope sometime to secure a modification of this promise and be able to report this case more fully because of its interesting features. I was brought in contact with it in the summer of 1911, and I have had it under my observation for more, more or less ever since. Having been present at a prob probably 250 night sessions, 250, many of which have been attended by a stenographer, Christy, who made voluminous notes. Okay. You want to read the rest of this from, from there down there? Let me uh, turn your mic on there first. Let me turn mine off. Okay. A thorough study of this case has convinced me that it is not one of ordinary trance. While the sleep seems to be quite of a natural order, it is very profound, and so far we have never been able to awaken the subject when in this state. But the body is never rigid, and the heart action is never modified. The respiration is sometimes markedly interfered with. This man is utterly unconscious, wholly oblivious to what takes place, and unless told about it subsequently, never knows that he has been used as a sort of clearinghouse for the coming and going of alleged extra planetary personalities. In fact, he is more or less indifferent to the whole proceeding and shows a surprising lack of interest in these affairs as they occur from time to time. In no way are these night visitations like the, se the se seances associated with spiritualism. At no time during the period of 18 years observation has there been a communication from any source that claimed to be the spirit of a deceased human being. The communications which have been written or which we have had the opportunity to hear spoken are made by a vast order of alleged beings who claim to come from other planets to visit this world, to stop here as student visitors for study and observation when they are en route from one universe to another, or from one planet to another. These communications further arise in alleged spiritual beings who purport to have been assigned to this planet for duties of various sorts. Eighteen years of study and careful investigation have failed to reveal the psychic origin of these messages. 
I find myself at the present time just where I was when I started. Psychoanalyst, hypnotism, intensive comparison, fail to show the written or spoken messages of this individual have origin in his own mind. Much of the material secured through this subject is quite contrary to his habits of thought, to the way in which he has been taught, and to his entire philosophy. In fact, of most that we have secured, we have failed to find anything of its nature in existence. Its philosophic content is quite new, and we are unable to find where very much of it has ever found human expression. Much as I would like to report details of this case, I am not in a position to do so at present. I can only say that I have found in the, the years, these years of observation that all the information imparted through his sources, through this source, has proved to be consistent within itself. While there is considerable difference in the quality of the communications, this seems to be reasonably explained by a difference in state of development and order of the personalities making the communications. Its philosophy is consistent, it is essentially Christian, and is on the whole entirely harmonious with the known scientific facts and truths of this age. In fact, the case is so unusual and extraordinary that it establishes itself immediately as far as my experience goes in a class by itself, one which has thus far resisted all the efforts to prove it to be of octopsychic origin. Our investigations are being continued, and as I have intimidated, I hope sometime in the near future to secure permission for the more complete reporting of the phenomena connected with this interesting case. Okay. Let me turn my thing back on here. Oh, I didn't turn it off. Sorry, dear. You probably won't lose our day during the whole way through. Um, the fact that he did not get permission to reveal anything about this was the, the pledge that he made to the midwayers that whatever they revealed to them would not be told outside this thing as long as the human subject was still alive and that no one would ever find out who the human subject was even though they know who the contact commission was over time okay this is important because it gives a validation of a revelation that, that has not been tainted by human beings, okay? Now, the next slide I'm going to share with you, and I know this belabors this uh, fact at great detail, but I want you all to understand how Dr. Sadler went to great lengths to disprove this person doing this. OK, and he also went to great lengths, just like he did all the other psychic phenomena to disprove what was happening. You know, he had um, Thurston, uh, a magician, magician that he used to go around with. And they had they disproved psychics and spiritualists and all this stuff, along with Houdini. You know, Houdini did the same thing. All right. But I want to read this list to you all. And it's extensive. But I want you to know what was not involved with the Urantia book, okay? That's why I'm doing this. I want to make it clear as a bell. None of these things of psychic phenomena were used to get this book revealed to human beings, and that's very important, okay? It validate, validates the fact that this was a revelation, not some nutcase, you know, telling you that you he's talking to your mother or father, brother or sister that died, okay? So here we go. Let me let me make this full screen here for a minute so that I can uh, read this to you here. That is a little better. While we are not at liberty to tell you even the little we know about the technique of the production of the Urantia papers, we are not forbidden to tell you how we did not get these documents. Okay, so these are things that were not used to get the paper. So if somebody comes up to you and tells you any one of these things we used to, to get the paper, Dr. Sadler has, is telling you that it's, it's false, okay? 
at the very end of this list, it says Dr. Sadler's list of psychic phenomena that were not used to materialize the Urantia papers. Okay, and I know this is hard to read. You can download these slides and take a look and bring it bigger. Okay, let me call your attention to the following outline of present day psychologic and psychic phenomena, unusual activities of the marginal consciousness, the subconscious mind. Okay, this is what he's talking about. It's your subconscious mind. All right, number one, uh, this is all these in this list were not used. Automatic writing. Two, automatic talking, speaking with tongues, trance mediums, spirit mediums, cat catalepsy. Three, automatic hearing, cl uh, clairvoyance, hearing voices. Four, automatic seeing, dream states, twilight mentations, visions, automatic dramatizations, hallucinations, shifting reality feelings. Five, automatic thinking, automatic fearing, anxiety neurosis, automatic ideation, mental compulsions, automatic judgments, intuitions, hunches, automatic association of ideas, premonitions, automatic guessing, EX, ESP or extrasensory perception, automatic deductions, delusions, paranoia, dominance by marginal consciousness, dreams, and hypnosis. Six, automatic remembering, clairvoyance, automatic memory associations, telepathy, mind reading, fortune, te fortune telling, largely fraudulent, musical and mathematical marvels. Seven, automatic acting, automatic behavior, major hysteria and witchcraft, automatic motion, mortal motor compulsions, automatic overdrives, manic episodes, automatic walking, some am ambulism, don't know that one. Eight, automatic personalization, automatic forgetting amnesia, automatic disassociation, double and multiple personalities, schizophrenia, split personalities, nine, combine and associated psychic states. Note, the technique of the reception of the Urantia book in English in no way parallels or impinges upon any of the above phenomena of marginal consciousness. In other words, nothing conscious was used in bringing these papers to us. Okay? A lot of it. All right? <laughs> Bunch, bunch, bunch. Let me go back over here. Give me one second here. See if I can get back to the same place. Put right over it, didn't I? There we go. Okay, so all these things were not used in bringing the book together to us. Okay, so. Where are we at at, at, at this point? Uh, the best source of information on why the book was brought here and how it got here is in the Urantia book itself. That's the whole point of this. Yeah, Rodney. <laughs> From uh, you reading that list, it appears that Dr. Sadler actually was trying to disprove it. He was when he started out. To, basically, he treated this like every other psychoanalysis that he did on psychics and mediums and those people that say they hear voices and stuff. He did that for years and years and years. So he took the same approach he did in his work on the Urantia book. OK, and if you all read any of the histories of Urantia book, you'll find out that Dr. Sadler wasn't completely convinced about the Urantia book to well after the entire book was revealed. OK, <clears throat> so even during this 18 years of training him before they actually started to get the papers through, he wasn't convinced about any of it. OK. Does that make sense? That's why I wanted to bring this to y'all. If y'all understand the scrutiny of a, a MD psychiatrist had multiple medical degrees, had theological degrees with an ordained minister, had all this background. If he had problems understanding and, and accepting where it came from at first, 
why wouldn't we too? You know, so that's why we're doing this. This is why I call it an introduction to the Urantia book, because you have to go through it yourself and make your own decision. Because I believe the Urantia book is the fifth epical revelation of God to man. I, I have no doubts whatsoever. But he did not get to that point for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. And if we understand that, your approach to the book is different. Right. It really is. Now. I'm going to read you out of the Urantia book itself, some beginnings and ends of the sections, okay? And this tells us who the authors of the books were, okay? And it tells us some reasoning why they used those individuals. They found the highest source on the highest levels to bring us this information. For instance... There are four sections of the book, aren't there? There's the one on the deities. There's one on the local universe. And then there's one on the history of the planet itself. And then finally, there's the large section of the book of, of the life of Christ. Is there not? For each one of those, they got beings that's the highest authority in each level. For instance... The part on God the Father and God the Son and all that, that section was written by the highest possible source they could find. And we're going to find that out as we read these. Okay, so that's the paradise super universe level. Okay, the highest source in paradise and super universe. For the next section... For the local universe, they gave the highest source of a commission of 12 beings that the, were the highest in the local universe. Okay. For the next session, the history of Urantia, they got as a source beings that were here on this planet. And guess who those beings were? Midwayers. Right. You know, and they were headed up by a Melchizedek who is the highest source on the previous one, right? So the life of Christ itself, they got the highest source of information from both all the human contacts of Jesus, but also the written record and the recorded record of the midwayers of everything that happened. So you can be guaranteed in the life of Christ, everything that's in all four gospels of the what? The Bible are in the Urantia book. Not only that is all the things that they did not get in the Bible are in the Urantia book. Okay. So you begin to see the importance of all these things uh, for us to understand uh, where all this stuff came from. That does that make sense? Okay. So let's let's go to the very first, very first thing that they start to teach us in the Urantia book and that's the statement of authorship okay now I've lost who was supposed to read thank you Jane, oh. Jane are you still there can, I am here <laughs> can you see <laughs> is that too small no it's so tiny even with my glasses I cannot see it okay mm. so um yeah uh, Pam, how about you I apologize Pam, or Pam or Rodney, either one of y'all see that well enough to read it? Yes. Okay, you want to read it then, Pam? Sure. In formulating the succeeding presentations having to do with the portrayal of the character of the Universal Father and the nature of his paradise associates, together with an attempted description of the perfect central universe and the encircling seven super universes we are able no we are to be guided by the mandate of the super universe rulers the ancients of days there okay uh description of the perfect central universe encircling we are to be guided by the mandate of the super universe rulers so you're saying the angels Those of are, days. that's the, that's who the super universe rulers are that's right okay which directs that we shall in all our efforts to reveal truth and to coordinate essential knowledge 
give preference to the highest existing human concepts pertaining to the subjects to be presented. We may resort to pure revelation only when the concept of presentation has had no adequate previous expression by the human mind. So whenever they could, they used human statements and contact uh, uh, contact or content that's already been expressed by human beings, and they only revolt, resorted to revelation when they couldn't find it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Successive planetary revelations of divine truth invariably embrace the highest existing concepts of spiritual values as a part of the new and enhanced coordination of planetary knowledge. Accordingly, in making these presentations about God and his universe associates, we have selected as the basis of these papers more than 1,000 human concepts representing the highest and most advanced planetary knowledge of spiritual values and universe meanings. Oh, meanings. Wherein these human concepts uh, assembled from the God-knowing mortals of the past and the present are inadequate to portray the truth and we are directed to reveal it, we will in uh, unhesitatingly yes. supplement them for this purpose during upon our own superior knowledge of the reality of the divinity of the paradise deities and their transcendent residential universe. We are fully cognizant of the difficulties of our assignment, we recognize the impossibility of fully translating the language of the concepts of divinity and eternity into the symbols of the language of the finite concepts of the mortal mind. But we know that there dwells within the human mind a fragment of God and that their sojourns with the human soul, uh, the spirit of truth. And we further know that these spirit forces conspire to enable material man to grasp the reality of spiritual values and to comprehend the oh, you philosophy. Oh, the philosophy. philosophy. Yeah. of universe meanings but even more certainly we know that these spirits of the divine presence are able to assist man in the spiritual appropriation of all truth contributory to the enhancement of the ever-progressing reality of personal religious experience god consciousness um let's see uh indicted by an orvantan divine counselor chief of the core of super universe personalities assigned to portray on urantia the truth concerning the paradise deities and the universe of universes okay <laughs> Let me tell you what this means here in the very beginning of the book. This is at the very end of the Ford, okay? And the reason they put it at the very end of the Ford was to state that they assigned the Orvantan Divine Counselor, who is the highest source of the super universe personalities, to tell us about paradise deities and the universal universe of universes. Okay. So there's no source higher than this being on this information. Mm. Okay. So talking about getting it straight from the horse's mouth, this is it. Uh -huh. Right. You'll see why I put all these in here in just a second when we get done. All right. This was at the end of paper 32 which is the last paper of the first section all right and jane could you read this one for us please uh, 
Um, I can't. Oh yeah, I can expand it. I just see that now. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, presented by a divine counselor, a member <clears throat> of a group of celestial personalities assigned by the ancients of days on Uversa, the headquarters of the seventh super universe to supervise those portions of this forthcoming revelation which have to do with affairs beyond the borders of the local universe of Nebadon. I am commissioned to sponsor those papers portraying the nature and attributes of God because I represent the, the highest source of information available for such a purpose on any inhabited world. I have served as a divine counselor in all seven of the super universes and have long resided at the paradise center of all things. Many times have I enjoyed the supreme pleasure of a sojourn in the immediate personal presence of the Universal Father. I portray the reality and truth of the Father's nature and attributes with unchallengeable authority. I know wherefore of I speak. Okay, so this is a divine counselor that served in all seven super universes that lives in paradise, that's been before the Universal Father many times, and they chose this individual to, to present this revelation to us, to you. Roger? Roger? Yeah. Sorry. When you say they chose? Yes, the, the Ancients of Days. Okay. Uh. And divine counselor. So how is he made? That is a eventuated being. That's not, uh, if I remember correctly, it's an eventuated create a being of paradise. Okay. okay. The highest, highest source they can come from. Okay. Um, I don't believe a divine counselor comes from a human being like some of this does. So I could be wrong, though, y'all. You know, I've, you know, there's so many beings to keep up with. Uh, I, I make mistakes in that occasionally, you know. I'm not perfect, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> pretty darn close. <laughs> My wife says pretty darn close, but just not quite there. <laughs> I love my wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so they picked the highest source of information to give to you and me. Did they not? Yes. Do yes. you think it's important that you read this book? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think so, right? I mean, if you did nothing else in your life, if you read this book, you would do your duty as a human being. Okay? Because hmm. the celestial beings want you to know this stuff. That's what it boils down to. Okay, let's go on to the next one. This is uh, at the end. Uh, let's see, this is paper 31, so it's the end of section one. All right. Um, Diane, you're right back up again, dear. Is Roger coming? Oh, uh, I guess I ought to read this one because we got so few people. Let me oh, read this one. Right. Jointly sponsored by a divine counselor and one without name and number, authorized to do so, functioning under the ancients of days on your verse. Guess what one without name and number is? Who? That is a mortal that started as me and you, went all the way through the process, went through the entire paradise ascension plan, stood before God the Father was made a finaliter and given the title of what? One without name without and number name. because they're above name and number by this point. That's how much they Far served. Out. Far out, right? 
All right, these 31 papers depicting the nature and deity and the reality of paradise, the organization of the working and central and super universe, the personalities of the grand universe, and the high destiny of evolutionary mortals were sponsored, formulated, and put into English by a high commissioner consisting of 24, got that, 24 Arvantan administrators acting in accordance with the mandates issued by the ancients of days of Uversi, directing that we should do this on Urantia, planet 606 of Sedania, and Norlachidec, that's our constellation, of Nebadon, a local universe, in the year 1934. I want to point something out on this one. We not only have up here at the top a divine counselor, highest source, right? We also have one without name and number, an individual that started at the bottom, has gone all the way to the top. Do you think between this divine counselor and this one without name, name and number, they know what they're talking about? It gets can, pretty oh. close. Yeah, I would say so, wouldn't you? All right. Well, let's go on to the next one. This is at the end of section two. All right. The reason I'm reading this is I want you to know where this information comes from. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to the next one. Diane, you're right. Again. Presented by a mighty messenger visiting on Urantia by request of the Nebadon Revelatory Corps and in collaboration with a certain Melchizedek, the vice chair planetary prince of Urantia. This paper on un universal unity is the 25th of a series of presentations by various authors, having been sponsored as a group by a commission of Nebadon personalities, numbering 12 and acting under the direction of Mantusa Melchizedek. We indicted these narratives and put them in the English language by a technique authorized by our superiors in the year 1934. And then I can't see the rest because... Of your answer time. Of your answer time, okay. Okay, this one we have a mighty messenger. You remember us talking about mighty messengers before? What's a mighty messenger? This is us. This is one of us that started out in mortals, went all the way through the program, got up to paradise, and was assigned a mighty messenger. Okay, that's somebody with a little bit of experience, right? All right, we also have this is uh requested by the Nebadon Corps Revelatory Corps under certain Melchizedek, the vice gerent planetary prince of Urantia. What Melchizedek is that? That's Matt, that's Makovinchia Melchizedek, is it not? Yeah, he was yeah. he was assigned the planetary prince of Urantia as the vice gerent of Jesus, right? Or Michael. All right. Mm -hmm. Notice here it also tells us that it's also this com commission of beings from Nebulon that were commissioned just to do this. Think about this, y'all. These high beings were commissioned to bring truth to us, lowly mortals that don't know diddly squat, don't know anything, you know, pea brains, right? They went to all this pr trouble for us. But you think we should take the time to read it? I hope so. All right. Well, let's go on to the next one. Rodney, would you take the next one? Yes. This paper depicting the seven bestowals of Christ Michael is the 63rd of a series of presentations sponsored by numerous personalities narrating the history of Urantia down to the time of Michael's appearance on earth in the likeness of mortal flesh. These papers were authorized by a Nebadon commission of 12 acting under the direction of Mantusha Melchizedek. We indicted these narratives and put them in the English language by a technique authorized by your superiors in the year A.D. 1935 of Urantia time. 
Okay, this is section three. So they took this, they were working on this all of 1934. They didn't finish it completely till the beginning of 1935. Okay, so that's, this is all the papers on the history of the earth right before Michael's bestowal. And in this section, there's also paper 119, which is came from, is the seven bestowals of Michael. It explains every single one of the bestowals, right? That's what paper 119 is. Okay. I know y'all think I'm belaboring the fact of all these, but when you get when we get through all of these, you will have a good understanding of who, what, when, and where, and why they did this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pam, would you take the next one, please? Yeah. Assigned by Gabriel to supervise the restatement of the life of Michael when on Urantia and in the likeness of mortal flesh, I, the Melchizedek director of the revelatory commission entrusted with this task, am authorized to present this narrative of certain events which immediately preceded the creator's son's arrival on Urantia to embark upon the terminal phase of his universe bestowal experience to live such identical lives as he imposes uh, upon the intelligent beings of his own creation, thus to bestow himself in the likeness of his various orders of created beings is a part of the price which every creator's son must pay for the full and supreme sovereignty of his self-made universe of things and beings. Now, who's my, who's Gabriel? Gabriel uh, is the chief. Firstborn of chief. That's right. Firstborn of all angels, right? He is the chief mm -hmm. of all the angelic core. He is the chief of every single age angel in our local universe. They all report back to him, right? He's also considered what? Our first executive of the local universe. So he's number two under Michael and the local universe mother spirit. Do you follow? Okay. Yeah. It, so the second person in our universe of importance tells us in, it, this information, which he considers of most important. You see why this is the most important book you ever read? <gasps> yes. Know, comes from um, the top angel himself. Yeah, go ahead. Is there an archangel, Michael? There is a archangel of michael oh there, there's a difference what they have in the new testament about the uh, maybe in the old testament too of the archangel michael they're talking about the archangel of michael that's assigned assigned to michael when he first goes out to his local universe and starts creation so there's an archangel that is assigned to every michael and that archangel is called the archangel of Michael. He's the, the one that is there to protect him, make sure no harm comes to them, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure they're not accosted by the same beings that they create and that sort of thing. And that archangel is called the archangel of Michael. And because of translation in the languages from the Old mm -hmm. New Testament, that's why it was called the archangel Michael but it's the archangel of Michael. It's not the same thing. Okay. I see. It's a title, not a name, mm -hmm. right? You know, he might be called something like Galatia or Galatia or uh, who knows what his real name is, right? But he's assigned the archangel. If they introduced him, that he would be introduced. This is the archangel of Michael. His name is whatever, you know, it is. Okay. <coughs> That's a misunderstanding, all right? So this is Gabriel telling us that this was authorized by Michael in the first place, all right? And he does did this final bestowal to experience the same lives that we do. And by doing this, he does the same thing every other creator son does to earn his supreme sovereignty as God of his universe. Make mm -hmm. sense? That's special. I know we all should feel really special. You know what's that old show? Isn't that special? It's definitely <laughs> special. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> all right. Uh, we're still are doing all right. Uh, Jane, can you see this one? Is it big enough for you to be able to read? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> all right. Acting under the supervision of a commission of 12 members of the United Brotherhood of Eurantium Midwayers, conjointly sponsored by the presiding head of our order and the Melchizedek of record. I am the secondary midwayer of one time attachment to the Apostle Andrew, and I am authorized to place on record the narrative of the life transactions of Jesus of Nazareth as they were observed by my order of earth creatures and as they were subsequently partially recorded by the human subject of my temporal guardianship, knowing how his, his master so scrupulously avoided leaving written record behind him, Andrew steadfastly refused to multiply copies of his written narrative. A similar attitude on the part, part of other apostles of Jesus greatly delayed the writing of the Gospels. Okay, so the first Gospel about Christ was not written until 67 years after his death. Okay, mm -hmm. 67 years. And that was because Jesus, all the, when, all the time he was alive, he followed the, the instructions of the bestowal not to leave any written record behind. Because why? Because human beings would idolize it, create an idol out of it. Right. And he did not want that to happen. So he didn't ever read a re leave a record. So the apostles took that cue and, and decided they shouldn't read or leave a record either until later in life. And this is when the first record of the life of Jesus came about. It's about 67 A.D. And all of the Gospels had a copy of Andrew's original written record of what happened. So the midwayers use these copies and everything that happened as a base to build on so that we would know exactly what happened now at this point if you don't know what a midwayer is you're totally lost right okay so those of us who have not read any of the book i'm going to explain it to you and we're going to go into detail here in a minute about the uh midwayers and that sort of thing let me see how much time i got here Three fifty one. We probably ought to um uh let, let me leave it at that. I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna give you all a little teaser. I'm <laughs> gonna explain who the Urantia Ur, the United Brotherhood of Urantia Midwayers is next time. Okay. Because it's a very long story and I don't want to get halfway through it and have to quit. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next slide here. And read this all the way down to the very last, last paragraph, OK? To give you all a little teaser for what's to come. Evolutionary religion is sentimental, not logical. Isn't that interesting? It is man's reaction to belief in a hypothetical ghost spirit world. The human belief ref reflex excited by the realization and fear of the unknown. Revelatory religion is propounded by the real spirit world. It is the response to the in super intellectual cosmos to the mortal hung hunger to believe in and depend upon the universal deities. Evolutionary religion pictures the cir circuitous gropings of humanity in quest of truth. Revelatory religion is that very truth. Okay, I'm going to read this last paragraph and give you the teaser for next time. There have been many events of religious revelation, but only five of epical significance and these are as follows and we're going to go over those next time the point i want to make is two first 
hypothetical ghost spirit world. This is a world that we believe in because it's human fear of things unknown. Anything that goes bump in the night scares us to death, doesn't it? How yes. Did we get, how did we get people to start believing in God? Fear of God. Fear is such a great motivator. Okay? Yes. Reality is this. There are three levels of existence. Do you want to know the three levels of existence before I quit tonight? Yeah. Material, number one. The material world is those things we can see and feel as human beings. Material. Okay. Number two, marancha. Marancha is the next level of existence. It's outside the human sight range. Marancha lives on physical spheres just like we do. In other words, Marancha being lives on physical spheres. But, but they're part, spiritual. Aren't they spiritual, no, physical? No, they're Marancha. <laughs> We're going to get oh, to that. Okay. <laughs> The Marancha world also has Marancha materials. So some of the materials, even on this planet, are not only material, but they're Marancha and they're still outside human sight. So mm -hmm. Marancha existence can live on top of material existence and you not even know it's there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number three, what's the big third one? Spiritual, mm -hmm. right? Spiritual beings are even higher than marantial beings, okay? Guess what spiritual beings live on? Air. Mat material planets, just like we do. But they can exist on not only material planets, they can exist on marantial material planets, and they can also live on Uversa and Paradise, which is... 10 times the material substance that regular material is, okay? So you have to think of it this way. There's three levels of existence. There's spiritual, there's marantial, and there's material, okay? Got that? Everybody clear so far? I'm going to throw a monkey yeah. wrench in here, okay? I love these monkey wrenches. They make me so happy. <laughs> In between marantial and material, guess what is there? Midway. Between oh. two. Okay. And there's two classes of midway creatures. There's primary and secondary midway creatures. Neither one of them can we see normally. The primary midwayers cannot make themselves visible to us. The secondary midwayers, however, are close enough to human beings. They can not only make themselves visible to us, they can actually, actually manipulate material substances where the primaries cannot. Okay? Can so, you give us a, for instance, of when they might do that or what it might I've employ? got a slide coming up for next time that tells you All exactly right. perfect. Perfect instance when they did that. When Peter was in jail, okay? Remember, they, they threw Andrew and Peter in jail, and Herod had Andrew executed. But when there was two instances, one where an angel released one of the apostles from jail. That's, it, that's recorded in the New Testament. The other one was a, uh, a story of Peter being released from jail. And in that case, guess who did it? A secondary mid midwayer. That's right. Okay. And so, so they, they must did. be working off of orders. Yes. They're controlled by the Melchizedek that rules the planet, the 24. And they're also controlled by their commission of the primary and secondary. They don't just do things off milly nilly. You know, they have to have an order to do it. OK, but think of it this way. It was a secondary midwayer assigned to Andrew that recorded the entire life of Christ. So he was there through the whole, whole thing. OK, let me give you another little uh, thing before we quit completely today. And that is 
remember after the Lucifer rebellion 200,000 years ago, that it was the secondary midwares that were considered the demons and devils. Okay. Because they could make themselves visible to, to the barbarian humans and scare the fool out of them, you know. So that's where all these legends of demons and devils, devil possession, and all this thing came from. Now, don't, don't let me stop there because we know from Pen after Pentecost, they were all the, the demons and devils or the secondary midwayers, along with those primary midwayers that rebelled, were taken away at ch in chains at Pentecost. So mm -hmm. they're gone from the planet. Nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear but life itself, right? Nothing at all. Okay. Well, I hope everyone that's listened to this all the way through has enjoyed it so far. We have, uh, we got through 25 slides of 80 and uh, maybe in two more times, three more times at the most, we might complete this. Now, if you're listening to this and you want to hear just me talking, I have done both, both uh, parts of this in uh, a thing with me just talking, but it's much more interested with the group. It's interesting with the group because people ask questions and it clears things up, right? So we pray that you'll come back and listen to the other halves of it. And we thank you for coming. Let's say a little prayer and we'll quit for tonight. Father, we feel blessed beyond imaginary belief that you have given us this revelation in this period of time that we might prepare ourselves for that uh, paradise journey uh, to come. We thank you for those that have the opportunity to share this, and we thank you for those who have the opportunity to learn this material, and we know the importance of this in our lives after we've studied it for a little bit. We pray you continue to bless us with these many lessons. We thank you for all of our many blessings. Please watch over this crazy world. We say this in the name of your son, Michael Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. And let me uh, stop the share first. Uh, let me stop the Facebook. Okay. And the recording here. <coughs> and we'll come down here and stop this recording if I can get my mouse back. Y'all don't go anywhere yet. Uh...